Welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast, the official podcast of Ryan Johnson Ministries. This podcast was created for the purpose of equipping others for the advancement of the kingdom of God. We hope that you enjoy this episode and encourage you to subscribe to the Blacksmith Chronicles today. For more information about Ryan Johnson Ministries, please visit www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Hey guys, welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. This week, I have the distinct privilege and honor to welcome a first-time guest, one that I have been looking forward to for quite some time. Has a phenomenal testimony. Not only that, the kingdom work that they're a part of and what they do to help equip and advance the kingdom truly is fascinating. Has a huge heart to see many set free in multitudes of ways. I'm excited and I'm honored to welcome this week's guest to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast, Miss Joanne Moody. Joanne, thank you so much for being part of the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be here. Always want to talk about Jesus. <laughs> and that's always a good thing on this podcast platform. That is for sure. But there may be someone that is listening or watching this episode and they may have heard the name or they may have not and they're not very familiar with who you are. Give us a little bit of a background of who Reverend Joanne Moody is. Uh, well, I was raised all over the place, including uh, in Taiwan and Okinawa. My dad was military. So we moved every three years. I was raised as a Roman Catholic and then fell away from the Lord. And uh, when I was in my very early 30s, I had an incredible encounter with the Holy Spirit. And I gave my life to the Lord and became born again. Uh, after that, uh, I met and married my husband and we uh, became pregnant the next year with our uh, son, who is now 23. But when I gave birth to that child, uh, I ended up uh, going through a 91 hour non-progressive labor, which destroyed the nerves in my pelvis. And so for the next 15 years, I uh, went from being an invalid to a person who could not sit and sit or stand for more than a, a moment at a time, was on seven different opiate medications. And in my earlier life, uh, in my 20s, I was an exercise therapist and had a very, very rigorous career uh, in both music and in exercise therapy and was a triathlete. So to become an invalid after the birth of my son was uh, quite shocking to me and it shook me to the core. I really had to hold on to Jesus in the hugest way during those nearly 15 years. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I did not know that Jesus heals today. I, I had a relationship with the Holy Spirit, but in my cessationist church, they never told us that Jesus really healed. I mean, we prayed for people, obviously, but never saw any manifestations of healing or anything. So uh, in 2013, I ended up at a Randy Clark conference called Voice of the Apostles had to fly there uh, with uh, with surgeons' letters to the airlines on my knees. And the last night of that conference, when I was in the worst kind of pain, uh, the Lord came through a man named Richard, and he completely delivered and healed and set me free. And uh, from that point on, I thought the world must know that Jesus is who he says he is and that resurrection power lives within ordinary people. And so I told the Lord that night, you can have my life and I will do whatever you want. So from that moment on, uh, I gave away everything the Lord had given to me, which was the knowledge and understanding that we are partnered with the Holy Spirit to change the world. And uh, out of that birth, the Agape Freedom Fighters, and we are now 130, almost 130 uh, ministry team members of our team in nine nations. We travel the world. We teach the body of Christ from Catholics to Anglicans to Baptists to Presbyterians, you name it. We train them and equip them in how to partner with the Holy Spirit to bring a move of God into your church, your business place, your family, your neighborhood. Uh, we are about kingdom business. So that's me. It truly is a powerful and a phenomenal uh, ministry that you guys are a part of. Now, I am going to go ahead and drop this. Probably what really helps you more than anything is... There was a time in your life you lived in the state of Alabama. See, I'm originally from the state of Alabama. <laughs> I, live in, I live in eastern Tennessee. I was born and raised in Alabama. So that's probably the favor. Oh, right. Man. All right, let's go. 
I, I'm just saying that's that's probably what it is. See, I'm just trying to get a hold of anything that I can get a hold of and just say yes. Montgomery, <laughs> Alabama. Yes, I did back in the day. Yeah, you, Montgomery. That's uh, that's truly southern, is what we would say there in the state of Alabama. They they speak a different dialect there. <laughs> for sure. I'm as southern as they come, as you can tell in my voice. But it's it's totally different in Montgomery. I will admit that. But for sure, there's a different accent happening. Oh, yeah, the fact that we have you on here, I have to ask you. You know, here we are. We're coming into the tail end of 2022. Yeah. We're going into 2023. I'm a firm believer that as much as I look forward to those new words that come out mm -hmm. every year and I enjoy them wholeheartedly, I, I do believe sometimes we fail to finish well yeah. and launch sure. out in a good way as mm -hmm. well. Uh, and I'm curious, what what do you feel like the Lord has been highlighting to you as we end this year and we go into 2023? I know that's a loaded question, but I just want to pick your brain on this because I'm fascinated to hear what you would have to share. I think that, you know, if for those who are listening and um, those who are spending time with the Lord, he's so faithful to tell us what is what he's about to do. He's faithful to invite us uh, into what he's doing. And I, I think one of the things that's fascinating to me is throughout the journey of the pandemic, uh, the Lord was speaking to me really, really clearly. And I'll, I'll tell you what I believe the messaging was. Um, it, it is all tied back richly to the word of God as every prophetic word needs to be. Uh, we have to test the spirits in that. But the Lord had spoken to me at the very, very beginning of COVID and said, uh, he, he gave me this word, mend the nets, mend the nets for the catch is the greatest the earth has ever seen, mend the nets. And that came out of Matthew um, chapter four, I believe um, in verse 24, uh, it, in, in Men the Nets, it is that moment when Jesus goes to the disciples and uh, they're sitting in the boat, James and John with Zebedee, their dad, and they're mending the nets. And so you think, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, that word mend is katartizo, and it's used 19 different times in the New Testament. And it talks about refitting and repairing the bride of Christ uh, for the great harvest that is to come, right? Men the nets, men the nets, the catch is the greatest the earth has ever seen. And so when the Lord gave me that, uh, that word, I knew we were in for our season of preparation. So when you asked me, what did we finish well? What did we not finish well? I believe there was an invitation even during COVID with all of the strain and stress and loss and grief. There was a, there was a, an invitation from the Lord to get our hearts right. Uh, to become an unoffendable people so that we would actually unify uh, multi-generationally, multi-denominationally, uh, socioeconomically, racially. We would unify to prepare for this great harvest. Uh, and, I, and I think some of us did, some of us didn't, right? And so then the next word the Lord gave me uh, after that was prepare for the aftermath. And I thought, gosh, the aftermath, that doesn't sound fun. You know, we're always thinking about the aftermath of a storm, the aftermath of uh, a great pandemic, right? But that's actually an agricultural term that has a, a significant meaning if you're looking at the harvest that's at our doorstep. And that uh, aftermath word means double crop harvest. So it could mean two different crops growing on a land that should yield half that, or it could mean uh, the same crop with double the amount. So if you take that messaging back to the prophetic and say, oh my gosh, we're entering a time where these harvest fields are going to yield double uh, what, what we think, all right? So the, the next word going into 2023, the Lord has given to me was it's trench digging time. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not an awesome word that I wanted to hear, just being <laughs> honest. Uh, Second Kings, we're, we're looking at uh, Jehoram and Joseph, uh, Jehoshaphat who go to the king of Moab and they're gonna, you know, give him what for because he's not paying his taxes to uh, Jehoram and they run out of water. They're in the desert of Edom and they're, they're dying. Their troops are, their troops are without water. Their, their animals are without water for seven days. And they go to look for the prophet Elisha and Elisha wants nothing to do with them because uh, Jehoram is just a wicked king. And, but for the sake of uh, Jehoshaphat, he decides that he will listen to them. But instead of giving them an answer for where is the water, he calls for a worship team. What fascinates me about this story, and this is where I believe we are headed for 2023, is that they do not expect him to do that. And 
he, you know, we read that story, we go, ah, well, you know, he called for a worshiper to come in and play a tune or two. We don't know. I mean, they could have been in worship for three days for all we know. He asked for the worshipers to come. And as they worshiped the Lord, then the answer came. I think that we are in a season of refining. We've got to get back to worshiping as kingdom priests so that the voice of the prophet can be identified and we can move upon the word of the Lord. So in that story, as Elisha gives them uh, what the Lord has said, it's not what they expect at all. I believe we're in for the same thing. He says, if you want to have water, you're going to have to go out there and dig trenches. Now imagine uh, this army is dying of thirst. Their animals are dying of thirst and they are expecting the prophet to say, here's a cup of water. Instead, he says, here's a shovel. How fun is that? So they have to go and dig these trenches because the prophet says there will be a deluge of rain. But when the rain falls on the parched ground without trenches, dug, you'll miss it. You will not have water. So digging the trenches was provisionary for the great outpouring that is to come. And I believe that we are in a season in our own lives where the Lord's asking us to refine what we're doing, refine how we spend our time. And to dig trenches means to prepare. What is the Lord saying do? If he's saying unify my bride, there are things that in our own hearts that are trenches of offense, trenches of unforgiveness. There are places where he wants us to prepare. Uh, learning Portuguese is one of my trench digging things. I don't have time to learn Portuguese, but I know how many times the Lord keeps sending me to Brazil. And I believe that the Lord uh, is asking me, will you do this for me? I want you to be able to converse uh, in that language. There are specific things that the Lord is asking us to do to prep for the season ahead. So trench digging time is the big one. And the last one that I'll say is to dwell in the tent of God. Just as Joshua, when he was invited into the tent by Moses, he went into that tent and he didn't want to leave. And, and I believe that when you read the story of Joshua and how many times the Lord told him to be bold and courageous, be fearless, you can do this, go out there, that Joshua had to keep returning to the tent to be intimate with God so that he would have the boldness and the courage to fulfill what God had asked him to do. I believe we are to dig trenches and we are to dwell in intimacy with God so that we will have the fearlessness to ready the army that is the bride of Christ to bring in this great harvest. My goodness, that is powerful. There are a couple of things I do want to ask you about. One, believe this or not, I, I actually watched some videos on mending nets one time. Come That's on. A long story, but I, I was just curious about it. And um, I was really fascinated about the difficulty of mending a net. It's not as simple as what I would have perceived it to be. Um, it's a very articulate thing, but it's a very challenging thing at the same time. And I, that kind of caught me off guard uh, when you talk about mending nets mm -hmm. and the cost and, and you know why would you even mend the net? We're we're such a culture of it's broken, throw it away. Yeah, throw it away. Let's get something new. Right. 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 Yeah. Whereas in in a lot of cultures, like in Greece, for example, where they still use large nets to catch mm -hmm. fish, and stuff, it is a lot more valuable to keep a hold of that particular net. It could have been passed down for generations. It could have had sentimental reasons, whatever the case may be. And so they mend this, but it, it's such a funny uh, work to be able to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't have the ability to mend a net. When you're saying that and you're thinking about that, I, I'm just, my, my wheels are turning about how individuals don't like to go after the finite things, you know, when you're talking about a refining that, that, you yeah. know, to deal with those things that you, if you hold it up, you can't see, you have to really inspect it to find right. where it's broken. Right. And when you go into the trench digging again, this is a labor intensive thing where yeah. I feel like there's a lot in modern time where they don't want to do the physical things. Now they have no problem telling you to do the physical things for them. <laughs> But they're not going to put a shovel in their hand. It's kind of like one of these things where I feel like a lot of people, and, and this is only my opinion, no one has to agree with me, but I feel like a lot of people have their hands to the plow. And they say, I'm not looking back, so I'm fit for the kingdom. But the problem is they're not plowing either. They're just That's a good analogy. with their hands to the plow. Mm -hmm. 
So my question is this. I know that's a long way around to say when, when you're talking about the mending of the nets and the trench digging, I know there's a wide range of answers, but yeah. what are some of the most minute things that keep people from mending those nets or digging those trenches that we just don't sometimes want to look at? We don't want to deal with yeah. Because I, I know an old terminology would be a stumbling block, and, and, and I, I get that to a degree. But these are the – when we're talking about refining, it, it's those little things that has to be inspected in that. And I feel like a lot of people that may be listening or watching, the bigger issues, ah, they're there. But right. those minute things, what are some of those that in your experience that you see just people don't pay attention to and they need to in this season? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, it's what we, most of us talk about our habits, our hangups, our, our hiccups in our life. I mean, it's, it's what you spend, what do you spend your time doing? I mean, when, when you watch something on television, that's one thing, but binge watching Netflix three days in a row and, and ignoring any intimate time with God, I mean, you have to refine your lifestyle, not to become a religious fanatic, but to become a lover of Jesus Christ and a receiver of that love. I think it's impossible to mend nets without love because the offenses in our life that, that cause, uh, if we're using these analogies, cause the, the holes in our own lives. I mean, if, if each of us is part of the great net that's going to, to catch this, this great harvest, this, this great load of fish, to use uh, all the analogies from the, from the time of Jesus, we are, there are certain people that all of us have biases against. I mean, I, you would really need to let God pummel your heart in a big way and get over your prejudices, get over your problems, get over your comparison, your rejection issues. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I speak in different places where I'll say, hey, we're about to do impartation and I, we're, our team's just trying to follow what the Holy Spirit's doing. If we pass you up, it doesn't mean we're not going to come back to you. Don't adopt a spirit of rejection. I can't tell you how many times, I mean, thousands yeah. of places a year where you're trying to follow what God is doing. And sometimes he'll drop on somebody in a front row and then drop on somebody in the 15th row. And you run back there to try to partner with him. In the meantime, the people's between rows 12 and 14 are all offended. You know, you left me out. You rejected me. The, understanding where is your vulnerability in your life? What are those pressure points, those trigger points that the enemy always gets you? And then invite the Holy Spirit in to heal you in those places. A, a lot of us have trauma from childhood or or, or along the way in, in this very dark world, we have collected trauma. Some of us have a spirit of trauma. Uh, making sure that you deal with the spiritual oppression that's on your life if you're saved uh, the devil cannot own you. You you are not possessed if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, but you certainly can be oppressed. And we treat we train people all the time as part of that mending the nets. You should be doing spiritual uh, cleansing or freedom prayer, deliverance, whatever you want to call it, like a car wash. I mean, go get your stuff healed up. You know, I mean, when you walk around with a with all this weight of the world and offense and judgment, criticism, self loathing unworthiness, all of these things become holes in the net. Because honestly, if Jesus loves us, laid down his life for us, then there is something within us that's valuable. It's called the spirit of the living God. If we are living temples, then we have to start living like we're living temples. And, and, and moving in that trench digging season, it, it becomes as you get healed, mending the nets, you look, you, you don't have to be navel gazing every moment, but God, what do you want to do in me so that I can actually move with you to fulfill my destiny? What needs to take place in me? Maybe, you know, as you, as your analogy was just so great, Ryan, you got your hand on the back of the plow and you're like, I'm good. Cause I plowed last season. You know, there is always something that God wants to be doing through you. So I always say to the Lord, Hey, if you want to use me in that area, what is not ready in my heart or my mind? What's a crack in my soul that needs healing so that I I can be prepared? Uh, and I find out those things through my intimate connection with God in the secret place. And so will you. So I don't think that any of us can go out and dig a trench if 
uh, are if we're crippled with internal pain uh, or uh, we've got some kind of ideology that God is mad at us or we have to earn something. Does that make sense? I mean, there's just so many. Oh yeah. There, well, I mean, that's the thing. There's a lot of different things that we could go on, but I love what you're saying about the vulnerability Yeah, to be able to have that in our life because you know, a quintessential, we live in a culture right now where the big thing for a lot of people is, well, I just want to live my own truth. <laughs> and that drives me up the wall, but there is yeah. one that I will say, that is that hits every single person on the face of the earth. If you want to be offended, you can find anything to be offended over. <laughs> and, and, and it's just, some of it is ridiculous. And so when you were talking about that, don't be offended because I skipped over, you went to that. I felt that I almost had a, a praise break right in the middle of your statement. Oh, you, you, I mean, it just happened. I was just, just speaking at a huge event in, in, uh, in Ohio. And, I mean, I will, I will sometimes yell that out if, if I'm running through impartation and I don't have the mic anymore, I will yell it. And I got a pretty loud voice because I watch a fence root in somebody's face like, like that, just because, and I'm like, wouldn't you rather us partner with the Holy spirit than to fleshly touch every single one of you in a row? So you can, what is that? I, I don't know, but we're just, we're conditioned. If you don't pick me next, then I'm, then I'm left out, you know? Yeah, I I immediately thought I was speaking at an event. It's about two to twenty five hundred people there, and uh, the event you know goes on. I get a message later from someone that I knew that I had no clue that they were there, and they were letting me know how offended that they were that mm -hmm. I didn't acknowledge them. And I was like, I didn't even know you were there. Yeah. And they said this was what was so funny. They said you looked right at me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, out of a sea of faces, I picked you out, you know? Uh, so, it, you know, it's just one of those things. It is funny. Yeah. And, and I will admit to probably what gets me excited about that too, Joanne, is I have the tendency, if you get offended, I have the tendency to offend you very easily. It just comes natural to me. I don't know why, but that's. I, that's I am. The, I'm the same. <laughs> so one of the reasons that I wanted to bring you on to be a part of the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast is this brand new phenomenal everyday supernatural experiencing God's unexpected manifestation in your life. It truly is a very fascinating book. I got a couple of things I want to ask you about, but before we get into that part of it, I just want to know from the author's heart, why did you feel like it was necessary to write this book for this season? Um, for this reason alone, I can't be everywhere, uh, traveling everywhere and, and everywhere I go and have the privilege of sharing and our team has the privilege of sharing. I found that people absolutely did not, they might learn from, from going and attending something, how to pray for the sick, for example. And then they just didn't go home and live it out. Maybe they were in churches that didn't believe uh, in healing. Maybe they, they weren't even part of a body uh, that would allow them to pray. I mean, you know, there, there are all kinds of, of interesting reasons why people don't act. And the number one thing is fear of failing, fear that God's not going to show up. Fear. Everything is about fear. So perfect love casts out fear. I wrote this book so that the ordinary person, which I am, who believes in Jesus would see and hear about the demonstration of the power of God through ordinary people. That book is just every chapter is a testimony of somebody on our team. Sometimes it's me. Sometimes it's me with other people. Sometimes it's just our team members. They're, they have every type of uh, uh of career uh, from nurses to school teachers to stay at home moms to people who are wholesale meat salesmen. I mean, you, you name it, we, we have the gamut. Uh, we've got Anglican priests on our team who actually function and run churches. But most of our people on our team are just ordinary people, everyday people. And they have learned that God will actually show up if you do what he says to do in the Bible. So I wrote these stories. Some of them are hilarious. Some of them are just, oh my gosh, shocker. And some of them are just so poignant to what people struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. I wrote the book for the everyday person so that they would have a 
systematic way of being inspired in faith through the testimony and then have prayer at the back of every chapter and then they are challenged with what's next empowerment piece what will you do with what you just read and what you just prayed because if you're not willing to do something about it you are not living the kingdom life that's why i wrote it and and i i I was going to say, and I love that you you brought this out. It is a very, it feels very personal. There are a lot of stories in here that that takes you on this journey, and that's a very fascinating part. I believe a lot of authors today, not to discredit anything that they're doing, sometimes we fail to remember the art of bringing a reader into yeah. something and not just you know, giving knowledge yeah. about something, but actually bringing them on that journey. And that's yeah. what I love about it. Oh, so uh, there's, there's a lot of things in that. But one of the things I, I got to pick your brain on this because I, I'm really fascinated by this statement here. This comes out of the chapter of horizontal people. Mm. Um, and this sentence right here absolutely fascinates me. And it is this right here. You wrote, I have learned that comparison stunts my growth and is an invitation to rebellion now here's why i'm fascinated by what you write there now i've read the before and the after so i know but i to me that jumps off the page it, it i i've said one of the greatest problems in american christianity right now is death by comparison when we put ourselves up to the latest greatest preachers or yeah. Sound like them, preach like them, even dress like them, and yeah. act, all these things. But what captured me is that you didn't just talk about how comparison will spiritually stunt your growth. You specifically said it's an invitation for rebellion. I gotta know what it is that you're trying to get across to readers when they when they're living in that comparison bubble. Mm -hmm. I don't pray like them. I don't shout like them. I don't worship like them. Mm -hmm. The rebellion side of it absolutely fascinates me. What are you saying there? I believe that when we are not doing what God asked us to do, I mean, he said, greater things will you do than even I did. And so if we're not doing those greater things, then aren't we living in rebellion? I mean, we're here <laughs> for his purposes. So here's the two things that happen when you compare yourself and I'm right there with you. Hey, this is a wrestling match because we, this is we're living we're living against an enemy here but we have the righteousness of Christ shining through us if we're just willing to let it out the two things that happen when you compare yourself to somebody is number one you are feeling like you're not good enough you don't have what it takes and you'll retreat and you'll go back and back and back and back until you become the most impotent Christian alive and you do nothing you just sit on the end of your row in your church uh, for 35 years and you make no impact which is rebellion honestly god gave us a command and he said to go and do this so why is it that we think that we can live complacent christianity and say that oh well we're just you know we're, we're okay the second thing that happens when you compare yourself to somebody is if it doesn't if if you're not getting favor and you're not being recognized then you start manipulating and manipulation is witchcraft and it is rebellion at the highest level. I've watched it happen to more young, uh, not even young, just people who want a platform. I've had 15 words, prophetic words. Okay, I'm living prophetic words I got 35 years ago. How's that? So when I tell my spiritual kids, hey, 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 wait a minute, you may have gotten seven prophetic words. I believe that about your life, but how's your character? How's your character? How are you being discipled right now? What are we looking at in your life? God, if he gives you exactly what's prophesied over your life right now, it will kill you. So oftentimes people do not want to wait, especially in the, in the society in the day and age we're living in. If, if you don't, uh, if you compare yourself to somebody and suddenly uh, uh, an aroma of arrogance erupts within mm -hmm. you, then you start manipulating to get what you want. And I, th that's what I meant because I've seen it so much. Um, it just, it just breaks my heart, actually. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the background just doing this right here because I, I love what you're saying. I, and, and I see it. Um, I, I've been serving the Lord for 25 years and preaching the gospel for that long as well. And I see it all the time. I see that 
uh, comparison, but I love the breaking down of the rebellion side of it. Complacent Christianity. What a statement right there. Um, and, and it is true. Not popular. <laughs> well, you, you know, I, I used to make this statement a lot of times. You, you'll hear people, you know, okay, you're born again. So now you just kind of tarry and wait till you get your harp in your cloud. You know, and that's why a lot of people kind of look at it is I'm just going to wait and die until the Lord, you know, comes and, and either raptures me up or I die or whatever the case may be. But there, we, yes, we're born. I don't want to discredit anything. Yeah. Yes, we're born again that we may be eternally with the Father. Yeah. That's absolute truth. Okay. But you're not simply born again to set back and coast through this life. You know, there, there it is. So it's re, when you're bringing out the rebellion side of it, I, I genuinely hear what you're saying is, again, going back even to your word about mending the nets and digging the trenches, there is personal responsibility in this. And I, it, unfortunately, we are in that generation where nobody wants to be held accountable to anything. Nobody wants to be responsible for anything. I Some years ago, I can remember catching a clip of um I, I didn't i've never watched the entire show i saw the clips and nobody come at me but it was a dr phil clip and he's talking to a young person who i can't even remember what it was it was a lot of trauma yeah. and the dr phil just kept saying you know this none of this is your fault none of this is your fault and i can remember they'd done a list of everything that that young man had done uh, and it was like breaking and entering, it was robbing, it was stealing, it was all these types of things. And I'm thinking, you know, there's going to be some responsibility taken. I'm not saying that he's not jacked up. Well, on <laughs> yeah, you know, but it, it, nobody's forcing him to go and, and, and break into somebody's car and steal it. Nobody's forcing him to do these things. And, and I realized back then, all those years, there's a great movement of trying to get people where they're not responsible for anything, not having an accountability. And that's such a powerful thing when you're saying about the rebellion that you just set back and you coast, you don't do anything, you don't, you don't take that responsibility. And I want those that are watching and listening to take heed to what that is saying there because we've been given a, a, a great assignment. It's a mandate. Yes, it is. Absolutely. But I think a lot of times, kind of like our culture now, we've made it optional. And, and deep, it, it, honestly, it's not optional for us. Um, it's what we're called to do. So thank you so much for even putting that a part of the book. I know there's more into it. And I, I just wanted to give readers a little bit of a taste of that. Another thing that um, really kind of caught my attention because I think, I genuinely believe so many people struggle in this area. Mm -hmm. um, you, you wrote a chapter specifically called When Things Don't Make Sense. And if, if anybody has lived long enough, they're always going to experience this time of life where things just don't make sense. Mm -hmm. There's no rhyme or reason. There's no, I, you know, I can't say, well, God wants this or God wants that. There's some things that we have to get to the place where we just say, I don't know. Yeah. And and not necessarily just, you know, be over joyful in that. I don't know, but we get to a place where we go, okay, I'm going to lean into his understanding, yeah. not my own. But one of these things, one of these sentences here, you put, we must learn to navigate the tension yeah. of living in the now and the not yet. What struck me about that is that key word that you put there, tension, that intrigues me because I think a lot of people would, 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 would say, Joanne, I, I, you know, I know in the now and I get the not yet, yeah. but that tension, that is a word that, that kind of unnerves a lot of people. We, they don't want any tension in their life. They don't, want to have to fight for anything they don't want to deal with anything you know don't confront anything i don't want any of that so when you're saying the tension between the now mm -hmm. and the not yet can you expound on that and kind of break that down for us yeah because i i mean i think that my opinion is that in our christian life some of us thought we were just invited in to serve the lord and every moment was a kumbaya around the campfire kind of moment. Well, I, I asked the Lord one day, I go, you know, this was, this is really different than what I thought. We are not actually invited on a cruise ship. We were invited on a warship. And he said, exactly. And I said, so it isn't, 
it isn't about uh, cruising along. It's about holding a line by faith between the mystery of who God is and his majesty. So when you when stuff doesn't make sense, when you spend enough time with the with God, you spend enough time knowing him by his by his beautiful Holy Spirit, his majesty overwhelms you enough that in the moments when things don't make sense, you go, OK, I'm going to live in this tension of the mystery of God. I will tell you that um, the last word that the Lord gave me for 2023 was just last week. Uh, he told me that uh that I and his people were stuck in a holler. And I didn't even know what a holler was. I actually had to look it up and it's a narrow uh, valley between two mountains. And the Lord went on to talk to me about a birth canal that in a transition, there's tension, tension, tension in stage two labor before a woman actually goes to stage three labor, which is very short. Stage two labor is laborious, it's long, it's arduous, it's very, very difficult. And that is where I believe the church is right now uh, in regards to what God has planned in this next season. So that tension between, okay, I know what I see and I know what the word of God says. We are about to be birthing something if we'll just unify. But if you look at the word of God from Revelation to Genesis, every great battle in biblical history was won in the valley. And all we want to do is kumbaya it up on the mountaintop. Listen, we got to go up on the mountain. We got to have the glory of God uh, cause us to be awestruck and fall on our knees. But we don't dwell there because we come down in the valley to fight. We go back up and, and we dwell with him again. And we come back down and we fight. This is a battle that that really comes down to the core of who rules you. Does Jesus rule and reign over your heart so that you can find victory in the tension? Or does the world toss you this way, toss you that way so that you can never hold on and there you lose your footing? in the tension. We're going to forever live in this tension until we are home face to face with him. And we've got to learn how to navigate the tension. The Lord said you can have joy regardless of your circumstances. That means bliss regardless of what's happening around you. The only way to have that is to dwell in his majesty so that you can contend for his mystery to make sense to you in the middle of something that blows your mind when you thought it was going to be one thing and it's another, like you pray for somebody and you you know that you know that you know they're gonna get healed, they get healed, they lose their healing and they pass away. There's nothing more devastating than that. And, and at that point, what do you, you can rail against God, you can be mad, you can be angry, or you can say, Lord, if I did all that I could, then I am going to lift your holy name and say, you're the majestic one and you are the mysterious one and I still choose to trust you. It really is, it's a, um it's a challenging aspect of life, but nonetheless, it is a part of life. And I, and you know, I agree wholeheartedly and I, I appreciate your willingness to walk that out with individuals. Um, there's things that we're just never going to fully be able to comprehend. And I don't know what it is fully about mankind's need to understand. I'm fascinated by it. There's a lot of things that we demand to understand from God, yet we never question in life. Yeah, you know, for example, I know a lot of people that know nothing about how engines work, how yep. automobiles work, and they mm -hmm. never question the understanding of how it's going. Yeah. They just take the word for it, but yeah. they'll question everything about God. And yeah. I, I'm I'm fascinated on that need to understand. It, it it intrigues me on multiple levels, but you know, that's another thing. But I think I, it's control though. I, I think it's control. When you when you can challenge God, you feel like if if you demand an answer. Uh, then you're in control again. And so we don't, we don't like that. We don't like being out of control. That's a great, great point. I love that. I am curious when you're putting this together and, you know, the writing aspect, you know, you're getting your chapters, you're lining out, you may, you know, this one needs to go here yeah. and that one and, and so on and so forth. And you're sharing these testimonies. When you're doing this process, was there anything that God just kind of revealed to you or maybe showed you that you weren't looking for when you put this book together, this revelatory moment where God says, let me show you something. And it was an unexpected revelation or whatever the case may be in this process of putting this together. I think there were many, but uh, probably just to be brief, the, 
the chapter that I wrote about my mom doing the census uh, back in the seven in 1970 in Montgomery, Alabama, um, that came. I was writing, and I, I wasn't certainly not thinking about that uh, or even that memory. Um, but but I felt like the Lord wanted me to notice that even in my childhood uh, and all of our childhood, uh, whether we knew God, whether we were raised in a Christian home, that he was always there and he was always working. Um, the, the powerful uh, story of my mom recognizing people, never seeing their color, never seeing uh, the socioeconomic differences. My mom treated everybody like they were... Uh, they were priceless. She was kind and she was generous. And I remember just while I was was writing the book and this flooded memory came back to me about my mom and the Lord uh, really showed me uh, by writing that chapter that the power of observation of a child can become an imprint for life. So, you know, my, my imprint in that chapter was to see uh, people who were living in a in a depressed state, people who uh, had been marginalized and set back, and it broke my heart as a child to witness that. And then here I am as an adult uh, who I'm working for the Lord and have the opportunity to set captives free all over the world. And it was just that revelatory moment in, as a writer, as as someone who's just trying to follow what is the Holy Spirit saying. For him to bring me back to a memory that early in my life to say there were captives then, but I raised you to make you a person who sets people free. I think that the Lord uh, is always speaking to us throughout our whole lives, whether we know him or not. And it is the Holy Spirit in 1 John 2, 27 that teaches us all things. And the Holy Spirit brings things to mind uh, when we're sitting and dwelling uh, with God. And I I learned a great many things while I wrote this book about the consistency of God. I, the last thing I'll say is that uh, as I, I mean, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of testimonies, thank you, Jesus, uh, about miracles and healings. But the thing that became consistent for me in writing uh, that the Lord was showing me was the same pitfalls are common to all mankind across the planet. It doesn't matter. I could be uh, in Africa or I could be uh, in Ohio. The same, the enemy uses the same lies, the same traps, uh, and we have Jesus who uniquely sets us free through personal experiences and encounters with his spirit. You know, one of the things I try to do with every guest is give them the opportunity to have that last word, that final thought. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was a question I didn't get to come across. Maybe there's something on your heart you want to share Maybe there's nothing at all. And we've covered it all, but I do want to give you that opportunity to have that final thought. Okay. Uh, well, I just want to speak to those of you who have been um, contending for your own healing, for your child's healing, for your siblings' healing, your parents' healing, your neighbor, your friend. Uh, and I want to speak to you and say to you, never, 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 never give up and never doubt the power of the word of God and the power of the spirit of God within you. The enemy would love to uh, convince you that you are impotent, that your prayers are not being heard, but God is a God of order and he is a God of promise and he is a God of fulfillment. So I'm gonna pray over you. Uh, we just saw crazy miracles just three days ago uh, at an event in Ohio where a man came up to me randomly. He was healed of 27 years of debilitating nerve damage, crushed discs in his back. And in a moment, the Lord touched him and healed him. The cane went down. And uh, uh, one day later, I watched this man run back and forth. Uh, he could barely walk with a cane for 27 years. These are the miracles of God today. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that your spirit fall on those who are watching and listening right now. Lord, I pray by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, the resurrection power of God, that you would fall on these people. And Lord, that you would set the captives free, those who are suffering from anxiety and depression, God, those who are suffering with mental illness. Lord, would you touch uh, the synapses of their brain? Would you cause the neurons to fire in accordance with health? Lord, I speak to bodies who are in pain and command them in Jesus' name to be healed. And Lord, I speak to those who have been trapped with devastation and trauma. 
And in the name of Jesus Christ, I say who the sun sets free is free indeed. You dropped the keys, the revelatory keys of the kingdom in the disciples' hands. And the things that are bound in heaven, we can bind here. The things that are loose in heaven, we can loose here because of Jesus Christ. So I say to you, those who are struggling, speak to the condition in your body and in your mind. And by the power of Jesus Christ, break every agreement that you have to live that way and command that thing to leave in Jesus' name. I believe that it will. I believe that many of you listening to this right now are being healed. Knees and backs and necks, uh, even a deaf ear on the left side. Uh, I believe jaw pain and TMJ. Uh, Lord, I thank you for these miraculous healings right now. And if there is somebody that's watching this where a spirit of suicide has just come into your life, command that thing to go right now. You are worthy. You are worthwhile. You are the priceless treasure of Jesus. And we say all uh, matter of evil forged against you must fall to the ground right now to be without effect. And we say, Lord, thank you for your freedom. Thank you for your healing. And thank you that for the joy set before us, did you endure the cross that we would live lives abundant lives of freedom and joy and power in the spirit. Amen. So awesome. How can individuals learn more about the ministry work that you guys are doing? I know earlier you mentioned freedom fighters and stuff. How can they learn about that? If you go to agapefreedomfighters.org and click on itinerary or events, you can find out where we're ministering. If you'd like to find out more about our two-year online fully comprehensive supernatural school that also encompasses leadership and team building training uh, and how to move in discipleship with using powerful questions to capture the heart of the younger generations. You can check out our Agape Apostolic Equipping and Training Center and uh, come and see us. Uh, we have new a new term starting in January uh, and we'd love to have you come and do school with us. And of course, you're all over social media and yeah. all the links and stuff, and everybody can find that. And you've got previous books, but particularly, I definitely want to encourage everyone to get your copy of Everyday Supernatural Experiencing God's Unexpected Manifestation in Your Life. It is a Destiny Image book, which means you can get it at Destiny Image, Books a Million, Barnes and Noble, about anywhere you can possibly. And on our website. And which, which website? Both of them? Or? On Agape Freedom Fighters. Well, actually both, but agapefreedomfighters.org. You can pick up the book there. So again, those websites, uh, those that are watching the video, those are coming up. But as she said, agapefreedomfighters.org or agape, well, I'm going to stumble over my words Agape now. Apostolic Center. <laughs> Agape Apostolic Center. Agape org. I'm going to get that tongue tied. You got it. You got it. That's my true Southern heritage coming out. <laughs> Uh, I, you know, what can I say? But again, thank you so much for being a part of this podcast. It really does encourage me and bless me to have you on. I sincerely appreciate taking time to be with us today. Thanks so much, Ryan. It's a total joy. And I so appreciate you having me. God bless you. Thank you so much. And for everyone else, we genuinely hope and pray that this episode has encouraged you. It's equipped you and it's challenged you to further advance the kingdom of God. I want to remind you, make sure that you've subscribed to all of our podcast platforms, YouTube channel, share the information, leave us a comment, let us know how we're doing, rate and review. That helps us in the, uh, the, the logistics of everything online in every format possible. Share, share on social media and all those things. Let us know how we're doing. Guys, just remember, no matter where you're at in life, there is still hope and his name is Jesus. We love you and we bless you in his name. Thank you for listening to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. It is our prayer that this episode challenged you, encouraged you, and equipped you for the advancement of the kingdom of God. For more episodes or ways that you can partner with Ryan Johnson Ministries, please go to www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Please join us again soon for another episode of the Blacksmith Chronicles.